hand. So let's begin our study session. Go ahead, make. Go ahead and do your presentation. Uh, my name is Martin Olenek. I'm a partner on the audit engagement, and with me is Alicia Watkins and Nikki Acho, who uh, is, I think, in the restroom right now, but she's going to come right in. Uh, so okay. they're going to cover the presentation on the, uh, just overall the uh, financial situation, uh, go over the financial statements a little bit. Uh, feel free to ask any questions if you have any um, during the presentation, or if you'd like to, you can hold off until the end as well, uh, and we will uh, answer to our best abilities. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so what we thought we would do, um, you know, we, were, we were invited to talk about, specifically about the City of Dearborn Heights um, financial data. We thought it might be helpful to spend some time um, giving a little bit of background and sort of setting the stage and, and providing some context around governmental financial statements what you as a governing body should be looking at, kind of interpretation of some of the data, and kind of start there before we get into the actual numbers. Okay, so we'll, um, we did also want to, I don't know if Nikki's gonna hop out there with the slides, um, but maybe for now we can keep going and follow along since you all have it in front of you. So um, slide one just kind of gives an overview of what we're gonna talk about. Um, we would like to round up the conversation talking a little bit about Public Act 207 and provide a little bit of education about that. There's a lot of discussion. The city is going to be required to submit a corrective action plan pursuant to Public Act 202, so we want to talk about that a little bit and make sure you have an understanding of the city's responsibilities. Um, so before we dive into that, though, we thought it would be helpful to maybe provide some clarity about our role as your auditors and about what it is that we do exactly. Um, so that's why we did include our audit opinion. Um, and here I'm not going to read it to you, it's three pages, I'll spare you. Um, but it does a couple of things. So one, it clarifies for the reader, you know, our responsibility versus the city's responsibility when you're looking at your financial statements. So we are just, so we are engaged by the city council to provide an independent opinion about the city's financial statements. Everything that's in your financial statements, your information, your data, compiled by your, your finance team. And we come in, audit those numbers, and give an opinion to tell the reader basically whether or not they can rely on the financial statements as being correct and free of material error. And when I say correct, we're talking about sort of fact, you know, factually, but also in terms of being in compliance with the accounting rules and regulations that the city is required to follow. Um, we do a lot of, much of what we do is validating what's been given to us. So our starting point is that your finance team will hand us what's called like a download, a trial balance or general ledger download, and those are all the numbers that comprise your financial statements. And that's our starting point. They'll say, here, Plant Moran, here's our numbers. Have at it. And so what we do is we take that information and we validate it back to your system. So everything that we receive on any of our audits, we're always either looking to validate it back to source documents, to, you know, software, and many times um, when it gets into auditing procedures, then we, we also do third-party validations with banks, looking at vendor invoices, actuary reports. So those are all the things that sort of go into us being able to provide an audit opinion. Um, we kind of have the trust but verify methodology, so everything that we, we are given, we do have some sort of procedure either internally or third-party to validate those and we take all that stuff we did in order to be able to give an opinion so one comment to, to add to is uh, during the audit we deal with all the departments of the city uh, in order to val verify the numbers mm -hmm. and uh, as Alicia mentioned you know one of the key items that's always a risk item is cash and it's just in any organization it always becomes a higher risk uh, so that's one of the things that one is third-party validation so we do confirmations with all the banks uh, to make sure that the balances are exactly what you say. But we also work with the Treasurer's Department to make sure that they are valid and look at the reconciliations and things like that. So there's a lot of testing back and forth, and it's not just one department. It's various departments throughout the city. Great. Any questions or comments about the audit or the audit opinion that we Councilman have? Councilman Bazzi? Actually, I have a, a question <clears throat> yes. regarding your process. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay. Um, I, I was a lead auditor for a few years, and okay. one of the things I met when I worked for an aerospace company, even though the company was paying me, I was working for them, but I still, if I had any findings that is, uh, let's say, like some of the stuff that I've been seeing here, significant findings, it was, I was actually compelled to report it to the, to the Federal Bureau of, I'm sorry, the FAA. Okay. Or even if it's something fraudulent to the FBI, obviously, because it's aerospace. Yep. So in, in your line of work, if you do find something like that, which I find some stuff that was kind of interesting to say, um, who are you compelled to report it to other than you just put it in the, book, in the, in the finding sheets here? Who, who do you, who's actually uh, the reporting or the agency sure. that is supposed to report yeah, it? So, so first and foremost, uh, first our primary responsibility is to the governing body. So that's that's our first responsibility to make sure the council becomes aware of anything that we find. And so that's why we write the letters that we do. It is addressed to council, so that we have a responsibility there. When we perform, because we perform a single audit for the city, we also have a responsibility to report any findings to the federal clearinghouse, who manages basically it has a database for all communities that get federal grants. So if you get a federal grant, we actually do the filing. We take our audited report and file it along with our findings and the city provides their corrective action plan and it all goes to the um, federal clearinghouse. And then lastly, we also um, file everything with the state on the city's behalf, including the financial statements and our management letter comment. So those are kind of the three layers. So the local municipality, the governing body, the state, and because you receive federal funds, it also goes to the feds. Okay. Council Chair. Okay. Councilman Abdella. So just for clarification, Alicia, you are not a member of the city. You're an independent body of the city, uh, Correct. not employed Hired by, by the city. Council. And we, like Martin said, we work with all city departments. Well, you work with the departments directly, but you are independent. Absolutely. You're, you're not a... Yes, so we're, we're just... I re, no, I realize it, but I'm I know, I just want to be abundantly process. clear. So we are, we, we work for Plant Moran. So right. the city hires Plant Moran, and as employees, or Martin's a partner of Plant Moran, we come in representing Plant Moran, an independent third party. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilman Wenzel? I was going to say, that's one of the key items, too, is that CPA, you're required to be independent in all respects. Uh, when you're performing an audit, whether it's for a municipality or a private company, you have to keep that independence in line. And we have incredibly robust professional standards that we have to follow as well to maintain our, our license. So, um, so, so that's important to us to maintain our independence and objectivity, make sure we're following the lay of the land and the, the guidance that, you know, is bestowed upon us by our industry. Councilman Wenzel? Alicia, you said a couple times that you you, take, you digest the information given to you by our financial team. Mm -hmm. who, who is our financial team? It would be basically uh, the controller. The treasurer gives some information. Um, as uh, chief uh, executive officer, I would be part of the team. And so I, I would think those are the three main people, correct? And the yeah. departments. You interface with both employees at Treasury and uh, uh, Controller's Office. Correct. So we get a lot of information from the Controller's Office. It, as has been mentioned, we get quite a bit from Treasury on uh, pension and cash matters. Um, but then we also interface with like the DPW folks when we're getting into like water and sewer fund testing. Um, in that activity, we do work with those folks there. When we're testing grants, depending on the type of grant that we're testing, sometimes we interface with the police department, fire department, um, the CDBG team, so it depends what grants we're testing each year. Um, there have been times where we've done some pr surprise procedures at some of the remote locations, so I think last year or two years ago we did some procedures with one of the rec centers. Um, so sometimes it varies each year because we do build some different procedures. Oh, yeah, so we do work with the court if we go over there. I guess my question is, so you only audit what is given to you specifically, or sometimes if you find something, you go further? Well, the, the way that it works is we, we request what we want to audit. So the numbers are given to, I mean, we have to, somebody has to give us your financial statements to audit. So right, right. Here, Marianne, here's our financial statements. You tell everyone if they're factually accurate. So but we don't, go ahead. If I can just add on to, is the financial statements that you see, it's not the format that the city gives it to us. It's literally a, an account balance, 
quote unquote dump from the system. Okay. And that's automatically mapped into the financial statement. So we can see, okay, what are the balances and everything for sure. each, you know, for cash, for receivables, fixed assets, et cetera. And at that point, we look at the numbers, we go back to test it to make sure that we received the accurate information. So the, the the interface to make sure that the uh, download was accurate. So we go back and actually trace accounts to go back into your system to make sure that worked. And then after that, that's when we start doing our testing. Okay. So we start doing, so <coughs> line one, cash. Okay, let's verify that that cash balance is actually accurate, that it's the full amount, that's not misstated, it's not too low, too high, whichever way. So we go and we test that balance and we keep going line by line essentially to make sure that the balances are accurate in the financial statements. Perfect. So it's not that, um, we're just given potentially incomplete data and there it is. We don't take anyone's word for it. It's kind of like uh, Alicia said before that, you know, you can uh, have, you know, the faith in the numbers and so on, but you have to test. You have to have the validity you, and you make sure that it's actually accurate what's given to us. That's why we can give you the opinion letter, uh, the opinion itself uh, in front of the financial statements. Everything else belongs to the city. The financial statements, the numbers, and everything else. The opinion letter it comes from us saying, yes, we tested it, and you can rely on it. Uh, going back to Council Member uh, Bazzi's uh, comment about uh, some of the findings that we had, significant findings. Yes, we did have some significant findings over the last few years, uh, just from the perspective that we, as we tested, we had adjustments to the records. So we had to post adju adjusting journal entries in order to make sure that you're in compliance with uh, accounting standards. So again, the published document, the financial statements, based on our testing, you can rely on it, um, that it, it is accurate because we tested. And our, our team is here for probably the better part of six weeks, Nikki, five weeks. And we have a team anywhere from like four to six people here every day for a long time. So we do spend, we spend quite a bit of time okay. going through our procedures. Councilman Bazzi. Okay, so other than the data, so some of the stuff that I also I mean, did is interview employees you know, within uh, the entity that we were auditing. Yeah. So how does that work with you guys? Uh, so we do interview employees every year as part of our procedures. That is a requirement that's been passed down from our industry. And we talk about, um, we, we ask about whether folks have any concerns, whether there's areas they want us to look at. We have a responsibility to ask people if they're aware of fraud or the suspicion of fraud in every single audit that we do. Um, so that is a part of our process. We talk to different people every year, different departments, um, staff, management, and uh, we will always talk to council as well. Um, so that is absolutely part of our, our audit. Thank you. And, Thank you. And I will add that there have been times in many of our audits where we'll design a specific test to respond to something that somebody shares with us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about the audit? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. Okay. So starting on page five is where we get into just a, just a high-level conversation about financial reporting. Um, you know, when you look at your financial statements, there's, there's a whole lot there, as you know. And so just trying to break it down a little bit to the fact that you have a set of, you know, a couple of different set of statements. So the fund-based statements, which is like your budget statements. And then you have these government-wide statements. So just as a, a refresher, the, the fund level statements are really measuring current resources and current obligations. So it's looking at, you know, what did you do this year with the funds, with the revenue that was generated? Like property taxes that came in for fiscal 18, you know, charges for services, state should revenue for the one particular year. And what, what did you use that for? And when we talk about kind of a current focus, it's just looking at assets that are available to be used within like 30 to 60 days following, you know, a particular period or obligations that are due now. So payroll, um, you know, bills to vendors. It's not looking at kind of the full picture. It's not looking at 30-year debt or long-term obligations. It's just really looking at what happened this year. How did we do? And did we meet our budget? And then the government-wide is where you get into really the full picture of how are we doing long-term and how's all the resources the city doing when you pull them together. And we're going to talk about both of them this evening. So um, 
on page seven, we get into, you know, what, as a governing body, what should you be looking for when you're reviewing the financial statement? Because there's a lot of information in there. Um, so certainly the auditor's opinion, which is what we started with, you are always going to be aiming to receive an unmodified or a clean opinion. And that basically means that your the opinion that we're providing on your statements is without exception. Okay, and so we, that is the opinion that we have been able to give to the city of Dearborn Heights um, for as long as I'm aware, certainly as long as I've been on the account. Um, uh, we're going to spend some time on fund balance, but that certainly is a key metric that you'd want to monitor and that everyone is looking at relative to considering the health of a, of a municipality. Um, monitoring your budget to actual statements, um, you know, actual revenues and expenses compared to what you expected them to be. Um, and then page eight just gets into some, some other things. Some of this is actually a little bit duplicative, but um, other things to look at is, you know, our you know, this particular fund subsidizing another fund. It's not really the case here, but some municipalities we do see that, and so that's important to understand in terms of how the finances are flowing. Um, the last item talks about whether there's any over-reliance upon any one revenue source. So there are certainly communities that might have a really large industrial client or, you know, um, manufacturer or something in their community that makes up 30 40 percent of their tax base if they lost that one taxpayer they'd be devastated um, you, you're a little bit more diversified so you have um, you have more flexibility you know you don't have as much risk I would say um, but that's something to understand are we over relying on any one particular source and what sort of risk does that leave us with in general for municipalities as we all know the primary source is property tax revenue right so when the market hit Every municipality got hit several years ago. All right, so getting into page 10, let's just spend a little bit of time talking about fund balance because that's, that's a, a key discussion item when thinking about the, um, the health of a, of a local municipality. So, so what, is, what is fund balance? I mean, it's basically the difference between your assets and liabilities or your equity, as some might refer to it in the, in the private sector. Another way to think of it is, and it's similar to kind of our personal finances, right? What, what assets do I own? And what claims are out there against those assets? So just because I get my paycheck for a thousand bucks doesn't mean I have a thousand bucks available because I already know that my rent's due and my utilities are due. So it's kind of like what's left after everything, uh, all the claims to cash are paid off. What do you got left? Yeah, the one so, uh, misconception a lot of times is fund balance equals cash. It does right. not because a lot of times you'll have some assets that come in still that are not necessarily converted to cash yet. And then you have outstanding liabilities that, you know, kind of like Alicia's example, rent payment or uh, utilities, things like that. So it's kind of like what's remaining that you can spend in the future. Mm -hmm. um, you do, you know, and, and I think this is common knowledge, but um, you just kind of want to put it all in there. So, so obviously it's, a, it's prudent to have a minimum level of fund balance, and we'll talk some more about what that should be and what some of the ranges are. Um, you know, everyone has a different answer on this, but, but what, what we're hearing more often is, a, is kind of a 10% threshold. Um, but generally, if you're thinking of a bond agency, it's 10 to 20%. Um, and then there's some other metrics we'll talk about because other folks have put out other metrics, uh, but kind of all within the same range, I would say. Um, certainly, when we think about uh, the appropriate target for fund balance, there's a lot of factors that go into it, including the size of the municipality, um, risk tolerance, timing of when you get your cash receipts in. Um, so all those things have to be considered. So there's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all. Um, so on page 11, I think we talked about a lot of this. I think one thing that is important, the second bullet on this, which maybe doesn't get talked about as often in, in sort of in today's um, yeah, economic time for, for local municipalities, but you know, there's a there's appropriate range. Uh, most most of the discussion is about sometimes whether there's enough or if there's too little. But you can also have a situation where you have too much. And I, you know, I, we had that conversation with one of my clients several years ago. It's a it's a, it's a small authority, but they have a millage, and you know, they've d done a really great job of building their fund balance. And because they're small, they really should have a higher percent. They should probably have 20 to 25 percent. But they started creeping up to like 30, 35, and you get to that point, and now. The conversation is: Are you are you over collecting? So it's it's a balance, right? You you want to you want to be fiscally responsible, make sure you have reserves, but you don't want to have too much of a rainy day fund, such that you know folks feel that maybe um, you know that the millages are too high or you know charges are too high. 
So and that's from that perspective too. You want essentially the theory is if you keep the fund balance a little bit lower, the current residents are paying for current services. Right. So if the fund balance goes up too high, then the current residents are potentially paying for a future resident moves into the city. So there's a lot of schools of thought on that. But again, th there's a wide range of what's kind of a safe, I guess, fund balance. And that 10 to 20% is usually the threshold to look at. Right. Again, if you rewind back 10 years ago when the market declined significantly and property taxes decreased, et cetera, all of a sudden a lot of people probably would wish that they could have had 30 or 40% reserved. Right. But again, that range has always been around 10 to 20 to kind of, for the most part, comfortable range. Yep. Thank you, Martin. All right, so on slide 12, we've talked already about risk tolerance, um, knowing your revenue sources, sort of diversification there of the tax base, knowing upcoming spending. So that's also thinking about, you know, kind of looking ahead. A lot of communities are doing forecasting. So if you are, you know, saving for a particular project or, you know, you know economic development or a large purchase, and that's part of what you're saving for, just like, you know, Personally, we, you know, we might have a little more cash in the bank when we're saving for a vacation or saving to buy a new car or a house or whatever. So that's something else to take into account. You might have a, here's our operational reserve target, but we're also saving for a large purchase that's going to be $3 million. And so we want to have that in addition to our operational target. Or in our case, the golf course. Right, yeah. So what, whatever the case might, might be, but if you're, yeah. So economic development, I would say, Deferred maintenance and capital purchases are kind of the, probably the three big things that we see. And, the, and also, I'd, I'd add a fourth one. Some folks are also saving um, to, for pre-funding of pension and retiree health care. So those are probably the four buckets that we're seeing where folks are setting aside a little bit more than they normally would to be able to pay for those things in the future. Okay. Um, and then the last item on page 12 is just if, again, this wouldn't be the case really for Dearborn Heights, but just, you know, if you're talking to peers out there, like a township that, for example, that's a 1231 year end, they levy taxes on December 1st, like their, you know, counterparts in the, the cities, and, they're, and then they collect a whole bunch of cash in December for the next year, because their, their year starts in January. So they should have more cash, because there's a timing thing here, and they got to make that cash last, cash last for the rest of the year. So again, it's just varying facts and circumstances. So then page 14 just, um, we talked about the range, small versus large. You know, when we think of small, you know, small village, small township, you know, a large government, you're talking city of Detroit, you know, Dearborn Heights is clearly somewhere in between those. Um, the GFOA has sort of always suggested that best practice from their vantage point is at least two months, so that's close to 17%. Um, when the state of Michigan was looking at scorecards and, and trying to assess fiscal health of communities several years ago, one of the triggers they put out was 13%. They wanted to see communities have at least 13%. So just some other ways to look at and other metrics that other folks have used around fund balance adequacy. As you can see, there's no one right answer. Right. And then the last slide we have on fund balance is slide 15. Just clarifying the different components of fund balance, because if you think of your financial statements, you have fund balance, but then you have all these categories of fund balance. So things that are non-spendable, so that literally means they are not in a spendable form. And an example, the, the best example, the most common example, well, I guess there's probably a couple, but an example is inventory, for example. It's an asset. It's a current asset. It shows up on your balance sheet as an asset. It's not something you can spend. It's something you will use over time and deplete that asset. So that has to get pulled from, you know, sort of available cash. Um, and then restrictions are anything that are legally or contractually restricted by third parties for specific purposes. Um, and you and you have some of those funds. So, for example, some of the, I think it's 50 percent, but there's like some some of your MMRMA insurance pool money. Some of it can be used, and some of it has to be maintained. You can't touch it. It has to be available to pay for insurance. Um, or you know, some communities get Metro Act monies. Those can only be used for right of way type things. And so, um, peg fees, cable peg fees, franchise fees can be used as you want. Peg fees are designated for specific purposes, um, public education and and so forth. So the, the point of that is really anything that's restricted is a third party restriction. And even as council, you have no discretion over how those funds 
are spent. It's determined for you. So then everything else, the way that we think about it, committed, assigned, and unassigned, is really at the discretion of the governing body. So a lot of people tend to focus just on the unassigned part and say, like, what's our unassigned or unrestricted compared to expenses? But we look at it a little broader because really, even if you have committed or assigned funds, which you do, you have two million of signed dollars, which you know, the council several years ago said they wanted to commit to using for pre-funding retiree health care. Well, by an action, through an action by this governing body, you could reverse that and redirect it if you wanted to. So we tend to look at what do you have discretion over? And it's really all three of those last buckets, committed, assigned, and unassigned. And Nikki will Nikki will talk about that a little bit when we get into the numbers. Alicia? Yes. <coughs> In, on uh, unspendable, you said inventory. Does that include like uh, city-owned vehicles? No, those are considered fixed assets. Fixed assets. So those are long-term assets that would actually not be in those numbers because they don't show up on your general fund. They just show up on these government-wide statements. So what's what's typically a current resource? Um, well, I guess a non-spendable item would be inventory, um, prepaid expenses. So like a lot of times. Um, insurance bills, they require you to pay early. Um, so if you pay that in advance of when the costs were, the services were used or costs were incurred, you would have a prepaid asset that you use over time. Um, what are other, there's not a lot of non-spendables for government. There's some prepaids in general. Prepaids, inventory are the two key yeah, ones that we see. It's very, uh, there's not a lot uh, by any means. The inventory, uh, a lot of times you'll see in water and sewer funds because um, you might have inventory of uh, water meters or some yeah. repair parts, things like that, that weren't necessarily expensed because they haven't been used yet, but you have them that you can use in the future. But you don't have the cash, so now it's not spendable anymore. Right. Salt, obviously, would be one Salt, we too. sometimes see that if you have an yeah. abundance of. Correct. Yeah. But in, in municipalities, you don't see a lot of inventory um, right. in general, so. Um, but those would be pretty much the best examples. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. So now it would be our plan to kind of get into some of the numbers specifically, unless there are any more questions on sort of the concepts or the, the background information. <clears throat> I'm going to go. Hi, I'm Nikki Hello. Atto. So the most recent audit that we've done was as of June 30th, 2017. So the most recent numbers that are in these slides are as of that point, and then we've also included four or five years of history so we can talk about the trend and what's been happening at the city. So starting with slide 17, uh, so this slide shows a five-year trend of the corporate fund revenue. So as you can see, revenue has remained relatively consistent, increasing year over year, uh, with a small drop from 2016 to 2017. Um, and Alicia talked about this, so property taxes do make up the most significant portion of your corporate fund revenue. Um, overall, uh, growth will be stalled on property taxes as those taxable values continue to rise um, to where they were pre-2009. And one important concept is just a note as well on property taxes. As a lot of people see the property values increasing by, you know, 5, 10, even 15 percent, depending on the neighborhood, depending on the municipality. Um, you can only tax the maximum is 5% right. or CPI. CPI has been only about 1%, something like that. So that creep, as you know, as taxable values are going up, your taxable revenue or the tax revenue is not going to be going up at the same pace by any means. So I just wanted to make sure that remind everybody. Because of, because of the cap in the assessments, the Proposal A. Yep. And it goes back many, many years. Proposal A basically eliminated that potential of someone's property taxes going up significantly. Right. Yep. So the next slide shows that same five-year trend for the corporate fund expenses. So there has been some fluctuation over the years, but again, relatively consistent for this five years. Um, there was kind of an increase from 2016 and to 2017, primarily related to, um, you can see in public works, uh, general government and public safety, uh, mostly related to capital outlay expenditures and personnel costs. Could you... Uh if you don't mind, can you explain one charges for services? Would that be like, that would not be like cutting trees and getting reimbursed and stuff like that. What would that be specifically? 
charges for services. Uh, page 17. Oh, the 1.5. Uh, I don't know offhand. Like, it it would be like building fees, permits, some court revenues probably in there. The licenses and permits. They, they have licenses and permits yeah, already. Oh, and they have court. We can look it up. We can check that. We'll get back to we'll that. Yeah. We'll Charges for services. We, maybe we, do you want to keep going and then I'll. Sure, no problem. So, slide 19. This statement is directly from the 2017 audited financial statement. So, one of the things Alicia talked about um, as council is reviewing of the budget to actual statements. Um, so, this does show that uh, just for the corporate fund, budget to actual results. So, up at the top, you can see that total revenue was actually $4 million less than budgeted. And then it breaks out each function of government. So general government, public safety, and public works. In total, there were no variances on the expense side. And then the rest of the statement is on slide 20, where it shows that same thing for, it breaks it out, community economic development, recreation and culture, and then debt service had no budget variances uh, for the year ended June 30th, 2017. Um, and then in total at the bottom, you can see that uh, revenues exceeded <clears throat> expenses by 1.3 million. So that, that excess is what you added to fund balance last year. And the amended budget showed that you were basically going to be break even, but instead you were able to, your revenues came in lower, but your expenses came in lower as well. So you were able to add to the fund balance. Yep. So slide 21. This shows the, the five-year trend of corporate fund expenses compared to available fund balance, uh, which would be comprised of that assigned and unassigned that Alicia talked about. Um, so the other components that the city has are non-spendable, which you talked about, and then they're restricted, which have those outside restrictions on what they can be used for based on the revenue source. Um, so for example, at the city, um, like Alicia talked about, there was 3.7 million of unassigned and 2 million of assigned. Um, and so some communities like to focus only on that unassigned portion, but for purposes of this discussion, like she talked about, we're talking about these two components <coughs> that really are truly available for the city to spend. So that's the unassigned and the assigned. So Please. the key. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Sorry, so the key thing to look at here is that proportion of available fund balance uh, compared to expenses. So it's in red at the top. Um, so that proportion has been increasing each year, even with that fluctuation in expenses. Got a question for you, Nikki. With our fund balance currently at 13.2%, which you said um, is what the state of Michigan typically looks for ideally, and um, I know you had mentioned preferably over 10%, which it is. It, now, if when we close the deal on the uh, golf course, and that's going to be 1.8 million. Obviously, it's going to drop. But as I understood from the mayor, a lot of it is going to come from the fund balance. Obviously, all of it is going to come from the fund balance. Um, is that going to put us in any type of danger, or how, how does that work? I think it would depend on we haven't seen the activity for June 30th, 18, or even 19, I think, when the, when the golf course. Well, I'm saying based close. on the same numbers for right now, at least for this purpose. So if, if, if you, you took out 1.8 million from the fund, fund balance, so you got 4 million percent. left. Around 9%. But but we expect the uh, revenues to exceed expenditures for the year. Uh, those numbers have not been audited yet, uh, but there is an amount that we have in mind, and so it'll it'll principally match a good point of the purchase of the golf course. Offset. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know that it's a million eight. There's um, one of the things that uh, I need to have discussions is how this all gets affected when, because uh, the golf course is going to be in a separate enterprise zone fund, or enterprise zone, enterprise fund. So consequently, uh, I'm not sure how that all coordinates and relates to the corporate general fund balance because they put the investment in the enterprise. Does that become a, a part of the corporate fund balance or is it totally separate and only in the, I'm not sure how that's going to work. It'll be an enterprise fund, and it, will, it wouldn't be. It would be its own separate enterprise fund, not part of the corporate fund. Okay, and, and, and I think I'm, I'm drawing on, on my background and history, but 
I'm assuming that that golf course should be an enterprise fund. It, it will be. Yeah. I, I assume you're aiming, is it really an expense of the, the corporate fund, or is it more of a loan and a receivable? Yeah. And is it going to be basically, so if it becomes a receivable, technically it doesn't impact the fund balance in total, because it just becomes a receivable versus an expense. And, and my, my thought is the revenues that are generated by the operator of the golf course would pay that particular fee will be transferred by this body back to the corporate fund. So I see it as kind of a receivable for the initial investment. And then we, and besides the 1.8 million, because I have somebody, when you come in to audit, we'll present this to you. I've had somebody go through all the costs in regards to surveying cost, um, uh, attorney fees, and other such type of costs that I think should go in the investment of the golf course. And you know, the one thing that I do want to mention is that receivable or an expense of the corporate fund, it, it does need to be evaluated because if there's no intent or not, you can't pay it back, maybe it should be an expense at that point, an expenditure. Yeah. So it should be looked at, so it's not you know, a definite that the fund balance is not going to be impacted or not. Now the spendable portion, that what's available on the unassigned portion of fund balance clearly will be affected because that money will be spent and not repaid for quite some time. Unless you're, you know, until it's paid back, that's when it's going to be spent. Well, Councilman um, Wenzel. What, what is an enterprise fund? Enterprise fund, uh, example here is the water and sewer fund. So basically it's a fund that is paid back by the users of the fund for the services performed. So for water and sewer, uh, the residents that purchase water, um, they pay for each individual unit back to the city. Golf course will be the users of the golf course will pay for it. Part of the agreement with the county was Eric, who operates the golf course, pays a fee to the county. So the county does not lose money on it. Eric takes the risk of operating it and has to pay a fee. So that fee I see in the future as paying off the investment of the 1.8 plus in the golf course and hopefully would bring back additional revenue. Is that the way you plan on continuing to do it? Would, would you give him, a, would, would he have carte blanche on how to run the golf course? No, no. no. It, it, as a body, we all need to sit down and we're getting very close now. We got the other piece on the insurance this week or last week. I recall now if it was Thursday or Tuesday. So the liquor license is the next thing. So I would expect that the closing date um, is probably just after Labor Day. And what Eric has to do is he pays uh, this fee. So there's a, already a contract. Uh, the county went out, I think, for bids and selected Eric. Uh, before that was a national firm. And I always, we used them at Ford Lane. I can't, th who? Yes. And so consequently, um, that revenue then would be coming. This body then has to make a determination, and myself, if we want to continue with Eric or use somebody else. But first, let's gain possession of it. We're in almost at the end of the year. I don't think this is the time. And I know somebody asked me about a plan, and I will be the first to admit, I'm not a golfer. I do not claim to have any knowledge on how to run a golf course. My suggestion would be to utilize, is it Cress, Cressa? Cressa? From Plant Rand, who assisted us in the purchase and doing some of the due diligence and to help us come up with a plan to maximize. Because I think there's, uh, in fact, you and I have had conversations, and I totally agree, and I think at the last meeting, that thing is being underutilized. Uh, the banquet center, nine banquets when you have a uh, in 52 weeks, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, that's 150 potential dates. And, they, and the county only had nine? That's ridiculous. And, and I think that some of the items that are related, in fact, when I talked to Eric, he's excited. And I think the county's told us to leave them alone until we close. And I would suggest Eric come in here, but Eric liked to put some simulators and some other things that maybe you as golfers would appreciate. I know what a simulator is, but I mean, he's saying that in the in the winter time, 
he'd like to do that. My feeling is that the, it's a beautiful view from the restaurant. Why don't we utilize that? And I'm not going to go there for hot dogs and a bag of chips and a, and a pop, but a better restaurant operation where people will want to go, I think these are all pieces that I think we can really turn that into a significant, not only money maker, but something that Dearborn Heights residents would be very proud of. And I would like where, if, if you had relatives come in and you said, you know, let me take you to the, uh, uh, and maybe we'll change the name from Warren Valley to something else, but let's go to the golf course. You're going to really like the food, you know, and that kind of thing. And I think we'll get there eventually. You know, you mentioned the, uh, the girl from uh, the county company that's going to help us out with this. Um, have you have you come up with a plan yet or a, a number of how long it's going to take to pay that at one point eight million off receiving these fees? No, I have I have not. Um, I mean, at at a minimum, you know, I think it's conservative to assume that we'd probably get at least a hundred thousand a year. I think we can do much better than that with with these ideas and thoughts, and uh, that's why on the Crestna staff there were two people that I worked with, and we did our due diligence and went to the golf course, and they knew their stuff. And in essence, like I didn't realize that carts. For instance, the first thing they asked Eric was do you own the carts? And he goes, oh, no, I read them. And he told them, and they go, well, that's what you're supposed to do. Nobody owns the carts. And then, and, and they went through item by item. And the reason we did that is we wanted to make sure we weren't buying something that was going to just, uh, was losing money. It was not losing money. Now, Commissioner Webb told us that, but in our due diligence, and they opened the books up, we found that it makes money question is can it make a lot more money and then us share as a city in those proceeds and I think we can okay. thanks that contract. Okay. so moving on to slide 23 that was all corporate fund we're gonna get into the water and sewer fund so this slide shows the five-year trend of the water and sewer fund operating and non operating revenue so as you can see, revenue overall has remained relatively consistent since 2014. Slide 24 shows the same five-year trend on the expense side. Um, expenses did increase in 2017, but that increase does correlate if you look back to the increase in the operating revenue from that previous slide. Bless you. But overall expenses, uh, again, have remained pretty consistent. Can I bring up one thing? Um, there's always been a lot of discussion in regards to the general fund that the water and sewer fund is subsidizing the general fund, which should not be the case. Each should stand alone. I would hope that in your analysis and review, uh, you can help give assurances to some of the council members. And if, if somehow it's happening, I'll put a stop to it. But you, if you find that we are uh, doing something and, the, and it's one fund is subsidizing the other, you got to let me know, let them know, and we, we'll correct it. But please, in your review and audit, uh, look at that aspect. I think they would all agree. Mm -hmm. So one comment to um, address that. Uh, every year we do testing of expenses, and we make sure that you know they're classified correctly, they appear to be in the correct fund, et cetera. So over the years, we haven't found any issues but we are planning to do the same kind of testing this year as well. Yeah. I would, and I would add a couple of thoughts on that. We do, so we always look at the transfer, so where we think there's risk mm -hmm. funds are restricted, we specifically say what was that money transferred for? This is a restricted fund for a specific purpose. And so a few years back, we did know that maybe five years ago, there were some borrowings when you know the market crashed and there was a low amount of funds in the general fund, but we were able to ascertain that it was done in the form of an actual note, there was an interest rate, a repayment, interest on it, and that's, what, that's what's prudent. So that was positive. Um, the one comment we probably do have, and we do will continue to encourage the city to do, is to continue to revisit your allocations. Mm -hmm. And we, we tell all our clients that, because um, there are allocations between fund, because general fund provides services to everybody, and so there's reimbursements for, you know, everyone, treasury use, 
I mean, all departments use treasury function and accounting function and central services. And so there's these allocations for all the shared services. Um, and we, we think it's important to make sure continuing to revisit this regularly to make sure the allocations <coughs> continue to be appropriate. So can, can, can you expand on that? What do you mean by appropriate, if you don't mind? Like, because, you know, um, it, 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 just to make sure that they're sort of um, comparable to level of service being received. Um, and that one fund isn't under or overcharging another fund. So, you know, and that can be ascertained in a lot of different ways. Some people look at, you know, well, what's the employee count of the DPW department or compared to um, the fire department and, you know, has each paying their fair share for a shared service. Hmm. Insurance is another example. So would that be like, because um, I know in certain cases we've had uh, gasoline situations where um, water, I mean, it's in the water department, but some other departments have used that gas. Is, is that the type of thing that you're talking about? It could be, but some places gas is specifically monitored. So if it's like monitored, if there's a tank, you can kind of just like when you pump for gas, you might know exactly how much everyone's using. Or you might do it on allocation because you have a history and you have a data to say, we know that each department uses about this percent based on our history. So now we just kind of do a general allocation. But it is prudent to revisit those allocations every year to make sure the facts and circumstances haven't, haven't changed. Um, you know, who's paying for accounting? Well, everyone uses accounting. The accounting process is information for every single department. So every single department ought to be paying for accounting in Treasury, in IT. So that's the kind of, those are the kind of things we're talking about. Councilman Muscat? But you can't, in your whole audit, you can't tell me that if Water Fund paid for a repair of a vehicle and it got reimbursed. So, if the water, say we bought tires, go on any vehicle, and the water fund paid for it. You can't, there, in your audit, you can't tell me that the water fund got reimbursed for those tires from the other so department. So you're saying the water fund would be reimbursed and they also, also paid Correct. for it. So what we do is we do look at the allocations and uh, the city performed a kind of analysis of how much is reimbursed uh, and we looked at those. Um, but you can't tell me specifically if any particular item was reimbursed. Well, I, can I clarify something? Because I think maybe the, the underlying assumption to your question is that water was paying for something on behalf of somebody else. Uh, for, yes. Right, so that, if that came up, Actually, we would identify if that was the case, potentially. Um, if you knew about it. Yeah, we haven't come across any instances where any one fund is paying for something that they shouldn't be without it being reimbursed. So I just want to say that outright. However, our audit is not a 100. We don't audit 100% of the city's transactions. We can't. We'd have to have a team here all year round. We process thousands and thousands and thousands. So what we do is we audit on a sample basis. And we look at, when we test like, uh, expenses, for example, we look at what fund paid for it, <clears throat> what account it got reported to, what we pull the invoices, what was the item, was it an allocation, was it a direct vendor bill, who paid for it, why does it make sense that they paid for it, given the activity that they do, um, should there have been an allocation, should, so we, we do all that. So it's you pull a sample, sample size then? Sample. We pull a sample. Every, every office. Random sample. Yeah. No, you decide or it's given to you just a sample. We okay. Yeah. Now, the thing to just also say, so we decide on the sample, and if uh, the municipality cannot provide the sample, because they say, well, the invoice is missing, let's just say. We don't select a different sample. That means that's an exception. At that point, it's an error. So we need proof, or otherwise it's an error. Um, and based on testing that we've done over the last, I don't even know how many years, um, we have not found any errors in the way the expenses were allocated or charged to which fund, which account, et cetera. Where we found errors, which you'll see in our report, is like maybe the timing of where things like it should have been recorded in this fiscal year and the bill came in late instead of putting in the right year, it got put in the next year's budget. So we have found errors relative to timing. Um, but specifically to your question, Councilman uh, Muscat, we haven't found that to be the case. You know, the, the, the point is if we found that somebody, that any fund was subsidizing another fund, particularly if it's a legally restricted source, we have a responsibility to report that to you because that's just not allowed. Councilman um, Abdella? So, so, so you said when you do find errors where they're put in the wrong year, yeah. 
Is this something that you look into where this is, in other words, if something happened by accident, it happens. Obviously, with 8 billion transactions in the city, it could happen. But if it's happened consistently, it's hap if it's happening consistently, what is the next action step that you take to make sure that it is not, A, not only happening consistently, but just as importantly, intentionally, or worst case? Yes, so how, do you, how do you stop something like that? Because obviously, you, don't, you know, with numbers, you know, they can be played around with to look beautiful, but they could also, you know. What we'll do is, uh, if we find cutoff errors, essentially that's what we call them, uh, what we'll do is we'll test and see how much of a dollar amount it becomes. So if it's something that's of significance, one is that's going to have to be posted and adjusted in the record, so that way your financial statements are accurate still. And then on top of that, we give you, uh, we provide the council with a, essentially a significant deficiency um, letter. So the number of errors. That there was issues with cutoff and we had adjustments in this and this and this and this area. If it, we come up with, based on our testing, that the dollar amount is not significant, we often have a, what we call a past adjustment. So technically the adjustment doesn't have to be posted by the city because it's not material to the financial statements, but we still report that past adjustment to you so that way you know what was passed on. To you being the council, correct? The council, correct. Okay. Thank you. So and and any time, there, it is reported. Any time there have been timing difference, and I've made it very clear that we don't, we don't play around with that stuff, but I've concurred in a post-closing adjustment so it gets in the right year. It's only appropriate. I, I don't recall those being significant, but maybe I'm incorrect. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I think one year was around, I don't know, 80,000 or something, but maybe I shouldn't even say anything. I don't recall the numbers, but I mean, what we end up doing a lot of times, so one, we test a lot of expenses after year end to make sure that, hey, do they belong in the year before? And if we find errors, a lot of times we'll go back and say, okay, are we in agreement that these should be in the previous year? If that's the case, there could be a lot more that we just haven't sampled. So we'll, use, we'll have the community go through their expenses in more detail and say, okay, which year do they belong in? And then we'll test that again with a different sample to make sure that, okay, is this accurate now? So we, we go back just to make sure that we solidify what cutoff issue, what the exposure is, and then we can decide together, so, okay, is this a material adjustment or not? And we have calculations that come up with what materiality is, et cetera. And most of the time, uh, the adjustments are posted, and if they're not posted, they're on that listing to show the council what those adjustments that were not posted are. Okay, thank you. Councilman Wenzel? Um, there was a particular item that came up at our last meeting where, um, we might as well clear it up now that you're here and we can talk about it. Um, a, a vehicle was purchased by the water department, a boom truck. And uh, you guys want to fill them in on the, what happened because it was a boom truck for the water department, and the water department doesn't wouldn't use a boom truck, and uh, there was a there was a dispute about if that those funds were coming out of the water department funds and what they were for. Uh, the, the thing was that is we have a boom truck that they take out to trim trees. Every time it gets repaired, the water fund pays for it. That practice to me should stop. It's been like that for a long time. I've mentioned it more than one time. Boom truck does not do anything for water. So why is water actually even paying for the repair? Yes. What was the discussion around that? Because we weren't here, and I'm not sure that's something we specifically tested. Any response? Well, I'm just, uh, I'm just well, bringing that. that that's what that, my question was. How do I know that something is, one item is being paid for from water, and how do I know it's really reimbursed? Right. There is, there's got to be a, a check and balance there, but why would anything of that nature be even charged to water in the first place? Let's, let's look, Linda. At the water fund, there's inventory accounts, as you were speaking, and one of them is materials for parts. So a lot of those parts, because of the DPW is part owned by the water department, all of those expenses get posted to the inventories of the water department, and then it's requisitioned out and reimbursed by the appropriate department. So the part to the boom that he's talking about, not that I've seen it physically, the requisition, it will be put back to the DPW. It's just, it's paid through there and then reclassed out just like the gasoline and, and other expenses, it just flows through there. So, so how do, in our sample, you could follow the trail. We well, that, and, and, and that's, that's what I want to do. I want to follow the trail to make sure that everything that's not considered water gets paid back to I mean, water. I would imagine the finance team 
I mean, that, you know, I'm told that the water department owns everything. So if the water department owns something and somebody else is using something that belongs to water, should they be paying water to use them? <laughs> I mean, that's just like you have a house. I'm using your house. Don't I pay you? The same thing. It's a, to me, it's just it's wood nickels at that point in time, but it's got to go back to that fund. And I don't see that paper trail. The, the, the exact part that's purchased actually go back to water. I don't see it. They can say a portion of it goes back, uh, a, a certain amount or however they do it, but I want to know that, to me, the, the bill should never even be charged to water. Should, you know, we have a highway fund, we have a, a, a repair and maintenance fund, we have all of these funds, but why then is it charged to water when there are other funds there? DPW has a road fund. So charge it to the proper fund in the first place, you don't have to worry about it going back. process is to hear from the governing body on if there's particular things that you do want us to look at since we are going to be coming out soon to do our audit. So certainly, Council Muska, if you want to follow up with us and just send an email with the details, I mean, if that's something you want us to put in our audit, we'd be happy to look at that specific item. But, it, you know, it may or may not have come out in our sample before, so I can't speak to it today because I just don't have a recollection of that specific item. But if that's something that the Council would like us to look at while we're here, we'd be happy well, to Well, if the Council, I think all of us are in unison because I keep getting this question asked. I'm not sure why that, I have a guesstimate as to why that procedure was set up, but that's how we follow it here. And I don't have a problem with it going directly to highway. I suspect that because of the restriction on Act 51 money, somebody came up with this vehicle to utilize to allocate the costs and take that look as to whether or not it qualifies for Act 51. But that is, that's one guess. The other thing, as most communities, and probably if we, if we were in Livingston County, you'd find that uh, young cities that are growing finance their operations through tapping fees. I assume that's still the proper thing. So when this city was first formed and they were charging $2,000 for people to tap into the water, uh, that gave a cash rich back in the, in the uh, 60s, mid 60s here. And so the water department ended up owning city hall, ended up owning the DPW yard because it had this cash that was being generated from over 20,000 tap-in fees at 2,000 apiece and gave it a ton of money. So the procedure, I think, was set up back in the 1960s and we're still following it. I don't have a problem changing it, you but... As long as everyone's reimbursing... That's, well, that's what I, I keep be being, okay. being told. So I've been telling them if I'm incorrect, so even, I, I'm not asking you necessarily, um, and because I am certified, I'm concerned about the procedure and that the procedure it makes sense and it's being followed is number one, but number two is I don't have any problems changing the procedure, I have direct allocation if that's what we should do. Okay, Councilman Bazzi. Um. Okay, so I have a question. I don't know if there's a, there's a time that where we ought to be questioning findings from last year's audit. Should we wait, or is, is there a time? Well, this is 2017 here, right? 2017 findings? I, I, I would suggest maybe we wait and you go through this thing, if that's it's okay. Up, it's up to them. I don't have a preference. I, I would defer to okay. What would you like to do? We, we can wait. There's we'll wait. Few, there's a few. But I wanted to ask, actually, since we're on this, but uh, Councilman Muscat mentioned there, there's been findings every year since 2012 about allocation. Yeah, I was, that's what I was looking yeah. at. Because so, we have had some recommendations. Yeah, since we're on this topic for water fund. Okay, so since 2012, I went back to 2012 audits. Every year there's a hit with allocation of money or uh, something from one, this fund to, or from the water fund moving to another fund. So going. I guess going to what Councilman Muscat mentioned, since you guys already found there was a deficiency, there was money taken away from that, let's say, uh, whatever, $100,000. The following year, do you guys audit to make sure the money gets put back into the water fund for that particular amount? 
I don't, so we have not found any deficiencies in the allocations being wrong. Well, we, I, right so we haven't audited these numbers in a year. So we're, we're kind of re reminding ourselves about our procedures from a year ago too. That's why I pulled up this. So we did, you know, I kind of made the general statement that it's prudent to revisit your cost allocations and that's something that we're constantly looking at. Um, we do have a comment in last year's letter that says, um, so some of them are just general. Some of it says you have some old allocations that you've got to revisit and refresh and make sure something makes sense. But we did actually, because of the Act 51 audit requirement that was going to be out there, get into some of that. We do note that there were some equipment um, charges for major and local roads for which the, um, the source data could not be produced. So the, the trail wasn't clearly there. And so that actually is a finding in our, our report last year. We were just trying to catch up to you guys because we haven't talked about this, looked at it in a year. Yeah, from, but a lot of the findings from the allocations are from the perspective of making sure you update the analysis so that you're utilizing the correct percentages of how much to allocate. Um, rates, hours. The rates, the hours, etc. The city has been updating a lot of that, not the whole thing yet. Now, during our testing, looking at the allocations and things like that, uh, it did look reasonable, but again, they're dated calculations, so we'd like the city to update them. Okay. Um, ahead, again, yeah. that's just so for your reference, for, for this year's audit, it's 2017-002 uh, yeah, uh, reference good. finding. Okay, thank you. Yep. So, so your question was, do we go back and look at the prior year's audit findings? Um, so we, we do revisit them just to understand if management's made any progress, if there's been any changes, if systems or processes have been improved. Um, and then we sometimes, we, d we design procedures based on what we learned. So if, you know, if we found something to be of error and we went back to a community and they said, oh, well, you know, we haven't had a chance to get into that. You know, we had 10 things to do. We picked the top five and these are the five things we addressed and we're still working on these things. We may not, we may not get back into it because we already know what the outcome's going to be, right? These things haven't been addressed, but the, it's really the things that we understood to be improved that we have to go then and validate that it's been improved and that the issues are no longer still present. So we do follow up on those. Thank you. But some, some things change every year. So our audit procedures are not exactly the same year over year. We're required to build some unpredictability. So we could have something come up this year based on something new and different that we did that we don't do every single year, just to clarify. You know, I think he, when he asked that question, if you, if you find an issue, um, and say you find an issue in 2015, and in 2016, do you go back and make sure that that issue is corrected? If there needs to be money transferred or anything like that? Do you, do you make sure that that happened? If the money needs to be transferred, uh, normally the issues that we identify, for example, the cutoff issue for expenses, that's already corrected in the statements. We just want to make sure the following year that your cutoff is not wrong again the following year. Okay. So it's not that you need to transfer money back or anything like that because the statements are still accurate because we made sure that those adjustments were posted. It's just next year we go in and that's going to be one of those things that we'll test again because we knew that there were problems in the past. Okay. Now we test other things as well, but if there's problem areas, we'll make sure to hit those again because, I mean, from year to year, unless we see continuous improvement, we're going to keep testing the same thing just and, to make sure. And we, just to clarify, we're, when we do an audit each year, we're really focused on like revisiting the controls in place over a particular area. So in 2018, we're auditing 2018. We, you know, we can't go back and start auditing 2017 numbers again because we know there are issues. We're looking at the processes that were in place in 2017 that led to issues to see if those processes and controls have improved in 18. We're not retesting all of 17, just to clarify that. Okay. It will be testing 18, assuming that there's still the same problems until we're proven wrong that they're actually corrected. Okay. Gotcha. Good. As, a, as auditors, I guess we're pessimists. We assume that nothing's been fixed, so we're going <laughs> to check it. Professional steps. And, and, a couple, <laughs> and a couple audit ones that have been for a couple of years, and Linda and I have talked about it. She just started in January, so... Uh, those audit comments from last year really with John who left at December 31st but uh, the two that we wanted to kind of concentrate on one was 
the uh, payroll system recording a lot of the accruals. And so Linda has suggested to me using, we found that ADP could not handle that comment. So she found another company. I met with them. What's the name of the company? So I don't know if you're familiar with them. They have said that they can do that in the payroll system. So I have to make a decision tomorrow if we're going to go with them, but that would hopefully eliminate the one. And the second thing that we've talked about is uh, when John was here, I talked about during the summer, uh, BSNA getting the fixed asset package and then getting the fixed assets all updated. Uh, I think we're going to come back to the council and ask them to purchase the BSNA software. And then um, Linda's got a, a plan to attack that. So we, we do take these seriously because I don't want to keep going. Plus, when I was an auditor, nothing was more frustrating than if you had an audit comment, you came back to the client, and it was like it was ignored. We don't ignore them. seriously. So moving on to slide 25, we're still in the water and sewer fund. So this slide shows the five-year relationship of net income to operating revenue in the water and sewer fund. And the key thing we wanted to point out here is that net income being positive for those past five years shows that the rates you are setting have been sufficient to cover operating expenses. But we'll talk about more about operating income if you turn to slide 26. So this slide shows the components that make up your water and sewer fund net position, or equity, if you're familiar with the, with the private side. So there's four components to this net position. It's kind of like the fund balance on the other side. You yep. just call something different in water and sewer. For the enterprise Just to funds. make it confusing. Yep. <laughs> so there's four components of net position. So the most significant piece is this, is this orange column. So this is the investment made in your infrastructure and assets of the system. And then you have two two categories of restrictions that are set aside uh, that are funded through property tax levies and also assets that are held with the county to pay off debt. And then this small portion is your unrestricted or what's available to be spent by the city. So although the water and sewer fund has had positive net income for the past five years, that net income being generated is being used to pay off the debt and it's being put back into the system. Um, as you can see, your investment in, your net investment in capital assets continues to grow each year. Um, so leaving little to be added to this unrestricted portion. Um, so we just wanted to leave the slide with the, the, the prudent thing to do would be to, to review your rates that are set each year so that you can continue adding um, to those unrestricted reserves. <coughs> Reserves are negative at this point. Is that deficit. Yes. Deficit? We're in deficit situation. Right there. Correct. Which I've indicated to the council that basically uh, we've operated at a loss, especially when you had all when you take the depreciation and stuff on a books. And I think I'm accurate in, in assessing it that way. Correct. It's an accrual based. Yep. Deficit. Good point, John. But just to point out, I know for the camera. Um, the net position is technically negative in the deficit position. It just from the perspective the microphone wasn't picking it up. So moving to slide to the next section. So slide 28, we're going to get into the government-wide statements where Alicia talked about the two bases of accounting that are included in your financials. Um, so this is a screenshot of the June 30th, 2017 statements. Um, so this is the government-wide statement of net position. So it's the balance sheet on this full accrual basis. So this is where you'll see, so if you, if you wanted to look, it's page nine of your, of your statements. So this is where you'll see long-term assets, so capital assets, um, the long-term liabilities, the debt, pension, and retiree obligations that you wouldn't see reported on a fund-based statement. And then the second part of the statement of net position is on slide 29. So this shows all the components of your net position for your governmental activities, your business type activities, your component units. And so this snippet really does show, gives a good picture of the long-term financial health of a city. 
and this is on page 10 of your statements. So if you look down, this unrestricted deficit, it's 85 million at the bottom. So the unrestricted net position for the governmental activities in total, so this is all of your funds except water and sewer and component units. Uh, so the fact that that's negative indicates that legacy costs, so pension and, and retiree health care costs earned to date have not yet been funded. But if you come down further, total net position, it's just, it's a, it's a deficit, it's a smaller number. So when looking at your net position in total, that's the legacy costs earned today are offset by those capital assets, that net investment in capital assets of 75.9 million that have been funded in advance of their use and will benefit future residents. Cap um, capital assets would be, I presume, like buildings, like this building, et cetera, correct? It, yep, vehicles. Mm -hmm. So it's probably <laughs> worth noting while we're on it that this is, um, you know, so this is one thing a lot of communities are wrestling with where you're now, when you're government-wide basis, you're kind of in a deficit position overall when you look at things from a long-term basis, meaning that there's um, going to be some obligations that, you know, future folks are going to have to take care of. Um, this number will grow this year because GASB 75 is going to be effective and the city will have to put the full OPEB liability on your books and records. So this is going to tie into our Public Act 202 conversation where the state's kind of come in and said, wait a minute, everyone's got these huge unfunded liabilities, you know, most, maybe not all, but most communities in the state, and what are we going to collectively all do about it from sort of a fiscal sustainability and um, responsibility standpoint. About that, but this is kind of getting into the public okay. issue of the unfunded liabilities and what that's doing to your financial statement. Okay, Councilman Bazzi. So, the statement you just made, I'm sorry, uh, you mentioned that, the uh, things on, but you mentioned that obviously the state's going to require cities uh, to fund part of the unfunded. Uh, is that correct? Well, funding is part of it. So they're, require, they're requiring you to have a corrective action plan as to how you're going to deal with it, how you're going to um, reduce the, it's going to be a combination of reducing the liability and or increasing assets to close the funding gap so that you're better funded. Um, so part of it will be more, more funding, but part of it will also be looking at like your plans. Um, and you know, if you need to make changes to your plans, things that could bring down the liability, in addition to looking at options for increasing um, assets to set aside. So increasing they, assets, investing the cash to, uh, to make sure that you have some you know, earned uh, revenue from that. Uh, <clears throat> the bank r returns right now are so small that if you're able to put in a trust, there's other vehicles you can invest in to get a better ra rate of return. So there's just a lot of things you can do, uh, but it's not an overnight uh, requirement to get to a certain level. So ba based on your experience with other audits, other cities, um, on the, the state website mentions that we have to fund close to $13 million uh, this year. What is, I'm, I'm, I don't understand, I mean, is that like pretty strict, like you have to fund the $13 million or what? Or I'm not familiar with the 13 million requirement, so it might be something different. So Public Act 202 is a longer term plan, so I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but like one's like 20 years and one's like 30 years to get to certain funding bogies. So you got to get to like 40% for OPEB and you got to get to 60% if you're not there for pension, but you have like 20, 30 years to do it. So I'm Which not you're there for pension. We're there for pension, and what I was told, there's a number that Per the audit, OPEP healthcare liability was 168 million 693. All my discussions, seminars I've gone to, is I was told that by 2048 or 30 years, we have to be at a 40 percent funding of that 168, and that controlling factors are like you say, putting money in, and uh, that would. Um, but other controlling things is um, your plans, what you offer for health care, which is this gentleman here helps us in that regards. And so we got to come up with a plan that the council has to all agree on, and I have to agree on as a mayor separately and submit that. So that's when I think Mr. Camilleri from your firm is going to help us and take us through so we can formulate this plan and that hopefully Treasury would adopt. 
familiar with the 13 million, but um, that's kind of a. But we're, we're only allowed to spend so much out of our out of our budget to fund that, correct? Correct. Well, so you have, it's a two part it's a two part deal. So you have um, the 30. It is the okay. My my pension OPEB mix up. So for OPEB, it's 30 years to get to 40 percent. But the second trigger, the second test, is whether or not it makes up a certain percentage of your revenue. Um, and I think it's 12 percent for OPEB. So that you have five years to get below that 12 percent. So that one has to be dealt with a little bit sooner um, to bring that number as a percent of your budget down. So that does get back into not just funding, but looking at the cost and how do you manage the cost and how do you get the cost down. And, um, you know, we're just talking here about modern plan design, and John, I think we probably spent an hour talking about what everyone else is doing and how people are modifying plans and offering different benefits and implementing caps and um, hybrid plans. And See, this has been the question these are all the different things that for quite some time when we saw the 160, call it 169 million dollars. How does anybody, I mean, even comprehend that much money? And even if you take takes you 30 years to to get to a certain percent, it's almost like a double double whammy. There, you have to make up that difference, but still pay as you go. Correct. Yeah, that is correct. But the and uh, and I've had just some preliminary discussion with Mr. Camilleri, but. You bifurcate the liability because right now that's fire, police, and general government. So I would think we would want to set up two different trusts. Police and fire is one, and the second one would be the general government. So that liability, correct me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth, but they're going to go through and bifurcate so, because right now I don't know how much is police and fire and how much is general government. And then, um, so that, and then we set up the two trust, and then we would have to start putting funding in. So, uh, I, this is this is doable. It's it's a liability, but uh, I think we can get there. I believe we can get there, and I feel more comfortable with this than the state of Michigan's unfunded tri uh, teachers fund. It's fifty five billion. Which they're not even addressing. Jonathan, did you want to offer a couple of comments about how other communities are getting there? I know you work with some other clients and what they're doing to start to bring that number down. Yeah. Put you on the spot. Uh -huh. And I really did not introduce Jonathan Sorry. earlier, so I apologize. For uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Trianfi from Plant Moran Group Benefit Advisors. We uh, we help the city manage the the active and retiree benefit plans. That are offered. So, what are some things that other communities are doing? Um, I mean, some communities have taken the I, I would call it the more draconian approach of eliminating retiree health care. Um, some communities are doing that prospectively, including including here, where some new employees, based on the most recent collective bargaining agreements, anybody hired into the city new wouldn't in the future get. Um, retiree health care. Um, there are other things that are going on though in the health care um, industry, especially right now, um, around controlling costs. Um, so in the past, um, medical benefits have been predominantly um, driven through networks. So you, you have a PPO plan or an HMO plan that gives you access to networks. And you are, um, or the, the plan sponsor, accepts whatever um, reimbursement rates are negotiated by that PPO or HMO, so Blue Cross or Health Alliance plan or, or name your insurance company. Um, you as the employer are accepting what those insurance companies or those networks are re uh, negotiating with the hospitals for purposes of reimbursement. There is a growing trend in healthcare that's saying employers are trying to take more of that control back to say, insurance companies, you are no longer working in my best interest, my interest being the employer's interest to control costs. So I'm no longer going to rely on you negotiating reimbursement levels with hospitals. I'm going to do that myself. Or I am going to piggyback off the work of the federal government who gets the best deals and I'm 
simply going to pay some type of function of what the federal government pays. Um, and you'd be shocked, um, I've, you know, I've seen some of these numbers where uh, a, a Blue Cross or a, or a Health Alliance plan or an Aetna, they're paying about 250 to 400% of what Medicare pays for that same service. So if we're able to simply piggyback off the work and the, the pricing that the federal government's um, putting in place, we could actually keep benefits the same. There would be uh, lower reimbursements to the hospitals and doctors, but still fair, and we could actually lower costs. Okay. So it's, 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 a, it's a growing trend, and it allows benefits to be maintained, but still control costs. Okay, so. thank you. Councilman Bazin? Okay, so I did find it here. Um, this is a letter from the state. Well, this is actually from the state website. Um, it, it says here we have to, uh, it says annual required contribution, uh, $13.9 million uh -oh. for the amount that we have, $168 million. So is that, that yeah, we, we're going to talk about that. So it's by the state, though. That's, that's, that's the well, state's findings. Uh, retiree health care. I know. I'm going to tell you why, though. Yeah. Uh, the, the actuaries have always used this term, actuarial required. It kind of, the language came from, I'm sorry, so don't you give it Yep. Um, so I, I was just saying it's, it's, it's a little misleading, um, unfairly so, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why, because actuaries have always used this actuarial required contribution language, which um, is appropriate for like a pension system because you do have a legal responsibility to fund that. This state mandates local communities to fund that. Th that language just stuck. So for OPEB, that language has been used, actuarial required. When in actuality, it's not required. There's no legal authority which requires a community. So actually going forward, that language has been changed. It's now called actuarial determined contribution because it was tripping up folks saying, everyone was thinking you had a requirement because that's the language that's used. But for OPAB, there's nothing that the state does not require or any other you know, authority does not require you to make that. So. Going forward, that language is actually, you're going to see that language change in actuarial evaluations to ADC or actuarial determined contribution for OPEB. So your, the only requirement is currently that you're supposed to pay the current retirement benefits. Correct. So pay as you Every go. Year. The pay, pay as, as you go. go. And, and the law in Public Act 202, I read that it said the plan to be submitted had to be affordable, which would right. indicate that there's no way you're going to pay one third, like this city's around $40 million, and the, use one, uh, $13 million of its total revenue for an OPEP liability that is not going to be incurred right away is not affordable. Y yeah, so it has to be like a fair, reasonable, and they do use the word affordable plan, which it's, I think it's the Municipal Stability Board they put in place, is that what it's called? Yep. And they actually have to approve your plan. So your communities can't just throw a fluff plan together and say, here, we, we put a plan together and check the list. They have to say, is this, is this sustainable? Is it reasonable? Is it measurable? Are there any limitations? So, you, you know, a community can't say we're going to raise our millage if you're already at your authorized maximum, you. maximum rate. That, bless you again. Bless you. <laughs> um, so they're going through kind of all, all of that. Um, but yeah, that's the that's sort of the distinction there. Councilman okay. Wenzel, um, do you have an opinion on uh, are there any risk as pay as you go post a trust, or and is your opinion that we should work on setting up a trust for these uh, so, retire? I don't know risk. There's different reasons for setting up a trust. Earlier, I mentioned that if you put in a trust, you can usually invest in different vehicles, so that way you can have a better return versus keeping the money in the city. Uh, in the city, my assumption is your, your return is probably about a 1% on your funds. In the trust, you can probably get up to a few percentage points. So you can build up that balance much quicker. So that's usually a really good uh, way of doing that. Uh, that. And the trust does technically separate the funds away from the city, so the city no longer has control over it. But it does separate that money specifically for that purpose. So there are definitely benefits to it. Uh, that I guess the negative is that the city no longer has the funds within the city bank right. accounts. So one point of clarity on that is that as it relates to measuring your funding progress, unless you put it in an irrevocable trust, it doesn't count. Yep. 
So you can't just set money aside in the bank account and say we put $10 million in our savings account. The state will say, okay, great, it's still zero if yeah. you don't put it in an irrevocable trust. Yeah, so like the $2 million is assigned currently in the fund balance, uh, technically you're still zero funded, 0%, because you haven't put it separately in the trust that's strictly for that yeah. purpose. So, because yeah, my question, my, I was always thinking, I, I remember moving $2 million, mm -hmm. and then I saw the zero, and in my mind, said, where the heck did the money go? So you didn't, you didn't move it, you just earmarked it. Well, I'm just saying, when I saw oh, the zero funding Got it. from the state, I said, where did the $2 million go? Because I know the council voted to move it there. Yeah, it's still there, it's earmarked for that purpose, but technically but the council can go back and change it, you know, you can change your mind and decide to use that. Well, can't they show that yeah. somehow and then degrade it back out so at least we know it's, it's there? On the, it's on the face of your statements that it's earmarked, that $2 million. it's in your financial statements, but the council... But from the state, I'm saying that... Oh. The report we got yeah. they, the they won't because you can you can today as we're sitting here you can change your mind about what you want to do with the two million because it's just sitting in your bank account until and you put it in a trust where you then no longer have any discretion over it. And the reason I wanted we looked at the trust the difficulty was especially if you go back three or four years is cash flow. The one thing that's really impressed me that in running a governmental operation cash flow is so so important and if we move that in a revocable trust you can't draw the money back I'm not sure if they can loan money back mm -mm. and so uh, the concern was and the reason it didn't go in the revocable trust because we needed that cash flow for John to operate and pay the bills as a treasure uh, but it looks like some of this money now is going to be earmarked into an irrevocable trust so we can get a score from the state. Credit for it, right. Yep. See, I would rather see someone's health care, retirees' money, regardless if it's a pension of health care, be put somewhere where you can't touch it but Agreed. to pay them. Agreed. I, I don't like the idea of cash flow and I need it, I'm going to take it because there's no guarantee it goes back in. That's been my number one concern is to make sure these people get everything they've worked for and they've been promised. Agreed. If, if you were to s s start a trust process, is that something that can be uh, eff uh, effective immediately or does it take a couple of years to, to build it up or how does that work? So there's a legal proceeding that you're going to have to go through. Uh, I believe Gary Miatke, okay. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but Gary Miatke's already put together well, a yeah, trust. A combination of uh, Van Sean Timoney, which is our pension attorneys, and Gary, we've already kind of started the process of doing, I think it's a 125 trust, okay, okay? so the thing was, is then the market crashed, and then we said, well, let's put it on the shelf, because we had no money to fund it, and then there may, something better may come up, and you know, so why put the trust in, so, I mean, there's already, there's already started the process, so it's mm -hmm. on the shelf, they need to dust it off, look at it, and then, Van Geary and uh, Van Overbeek's team needs to kind of come to conclusion and come forward to city council. So I think, you know, you may start with Geary or Mike and then see where that yeah. process is. Okay, Councilman Constant, please. Uh, so our rate of inflation has been like one, two, three percent. What has uh, health care costs gone up in the last uh, couple of years? I know Jonathan used to get the ask. Start rattling them. You don't want to hear. A little bit more than that. Yeah. yeah. The 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 running rate in the industry right now is between nine and twelve percent a year um, for health care. Wow. Um, the the city operates a self insured medical plan. Um, so you can see from year to year, um, those increases vary quite a bit. But if you look at it over time, like a five or six year period, you're going to see a run rate that's very similar to what the market is. Okay. So we have companies like GM that just say, okay, no more retiree health care. And, and uh, that, that may not be an option for the city. Right. I, I mean, there's um, I mean, there's all sorts of legal issues associated with the collective bargaining agreements um, and what was promised to people when they retired. Um, so there's, uh, to my point earlier, there's employers, both public and private, that are taking um, steps to try and figure out how to maintain benefits but lower costs. 
Yeah, because a lot of employers now, you know, at the lower levels, they'll, they'll just hire people part-time. Correct. They won't hire anybody full-time to right. avoid the responsibility of the benefits. Right. So, yeah, you, you can see more employers capping hours um, because of the Affordable Care Act um, uh, requirement to cover people that have uh, are working 30 or more hours a week. Um, but you can you, you may have seen in the news recently where GM actually um, contracted direct with Henry Ford Health. Um, that's a no kidding. That's an opportunity where that like I was explaining earlier, where GM said, "Listen, we have enough purchasing power. I don't need to rely on an insurance company to negotiate an arrangement with a health system." Um, I negotiate all, I've got some of the best negotiators in the world working here. Let them, let them handle that and negotiate something direct with Henry Ford. Um, the truth of the matter is any employer can do that. Um, you actually don't need the purchasing power of General Motors to do it. You just need to be working with somebody that knows how to do it. Um, so th there's opportunities like that out there. There just hasn't been much of an appetite um, and frankly, there may have been an absence of the knowledge that you could do it, that it was even an option. So you're seeing more employers get creative as these um, issues become more problematic to their bottom line or the liabilities become um, scary enough. Okay, thank, thank you. you. If I might, because uh, the unions are here, I'd like to have from each of the unions or, or if you designate one or two people, but working with us as we go through, so you immediately you know you're part of the decision making process, and you know where we're going. So my pledge to you is give me a, a name or two from each respective union, and you'll be included in all the meetings because this is significant. We all got to work on this together, but that way you will know that we're not going in a direction that later on. Uh, people have problems with. So I, I make that pledge. Elizabeth? I will say that an email was sent out, communication to all of the unions. I, you know, obviously not everyone's here, but it was reached out that we would be having a state study session on the mm -hmm. Yeah, and 28th will be the start, but I'd like you included when I when I meet uh, with the various groups, and so you're aware of the direction. It's it's a big uh, thing to have to swallow and deal with, but um, we might as well bite the bullet and get it done, and then you're all assured health care, and the guys that and men and women that came before you will have the health care too. Okay, well, Councilman Wenzel. Um, John, just to go back on the uh, trust, if we were to implement a trust, would we still have to levy taxpayer money to fund it for a number of years, or a couple of years, 10 years? What, what's your opinion on that? Yes, so that means, uh, like, money's going to have to come from some source. Would it be 10 years or 20 years more? Or? Well, I mean, it would be determined, I would say, by an actuary. It would probably help us determine the contribution. So obviously none of that has been done yet. So I, okay. I, mean, I don't want to give you a, a year or anything like that. That's and you can you can work with them yeah, to gonna, determine sort of what you want your amortization period to be. Some people are going with a shorter amortization period, maybe like 20 versus 30 years, to try to put more in. But obviously that has to be affordable to the particular community. Um, but I think what we're seeing is somewhere between 20 and 30. Jonathan, you look at a lot of valuations. Yeah. I, I met uh, with a couple of communities and what they did. In fact, one of our neighbors did this. So they went out and bonded, right? and so they they hit that requirement and then they're paying off the debt. According to the state law, you have to have a, a double A rating, which we do not have. We have a very strong A rating. That is not something eligible to us, but there is talk in the legislature of allowing A, uh, class A, a rated A, uh, of doing the same thing. So that's also a potential um, situation. Okay, Councilman Bassey. So who's gonna be in charge of that committee? or uh, the negotiation for the, what we're doing here with, uh, with the health care. Is that Mr. Riley? Who's going to be in charge of oh, it? it's the administration. Okay, why don't we just, I mean, pick a committee 
from the fire department, police department, right, retirees, instead of sending an email blast, hey, whoever wants to do this, I think a committee should be formed. Well, I think that'll come in the organization of your trust. Yep. And you'll say, just like the pension trust, you say, this is your pension board, you know, who will be administrating. I think that will be part of the organization of the trust. Mm -hmm. And so I, then yeah. it'll dictate who will be the trustees on that board. Yes. And so at that time we could have discussion, maybe a couple of council members, a couple from the employees, some from the administration or a retiree, you know, whatever the makeup would be, could be discussed on the organization. Because this is affecting a lot of people's lives, so we need to make this tr transparent. So the committee has to be identified. We have to figure out, like, who's doing what, so... Somebody's represented from every organization. Thank you. If, if I could, um, uh, Clinton Township actually has um, a fairly um, well-established health care committee that's made up of um, their HR director and representatives from every union um, in the township. It's been functioning for three to four years now very well. Um, so if there's any interest in speaking with them, I can make that connection. Um, and you can ask some questions about how they put that together and how they maintain it. Uh, but it's been, it's been functioning very well. So. OK, thank you. Continue on. We're going to move to slide 31. Yeah. We've all already started these discussions, but we're going to get into some of the funding and funding statuses of the pension plans and the retiree health care. Um, so this first slide shows the general government pensions plan uh, total assets compared to that total pension liability, which calculates the difference between the two is that net pension liability that's recorded on the face of your financial, financial statements. So the general government plan is and has been over that 60% funded uh, mark that's being used as the basis uh, for PA 202 under that corrective action plan that Alicia will get into, get into more. Uh, the next slide shows the same data for the police and fire. Can I, can I, can I, sure. Just because of the fund, so the funding level, all right, I'm going to go to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So this funding level is the GASB 67, 68 funding level, is that right? Correct. Okay. Yep. Just because the mayor demonstrated on the board here a different funding levels, which are our what our contribution or the actuarial annual, actuarial annual valuations funding level. And so I guess what I want to say is that the pensions have multiple funding levels depending on which source you'll use. Is that right? Yeah, it's yeah. measured in two different ways. Right, okay, because I, I, mean, I want to be clear that, I mean, because you're saying 75% and we, and the actuarial annual valuation, we use a funding valuation of around 80%. That is, you know, so there are just two funding levels, and it's not that either one of them is wrong, it's different ways of putting it together. Yeah, the accounting rules require the liabilities to be measured under certain terms and assumptions. So it's very prescriptive around the types of assumptions and how discount rates are handled, the actuarial accrual method being used, and so, and it's probably a little more conservative, so it results in a different percentage, but it's just an accounting number. Like, it's just what has to go on your financial statements for gap purposes. But most of our clients also don't fund based on that because that's just for accounting. Most of our clients do get a second valuation, to John's point, in which you can work with your actuary and have a little more discretion around your assumptions and some of the particulars. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So which one, like, I grabbed the numbers from the actuarial report because I thought that was... From the funding actuarial funding. report. Now, one of the things that has come up, and I think it's going to be uh, held true in the public act, because a couple of... What, you, what your assumptions are heavily influences this. Now, to the credit of our board, they put in a rate of return from investments that is more conservative and realistic. I was told at one seminar that some of the communities are using a rate of return of 9%. That is not realistic, but That's heavily influences this number. So in our city, I think we use 7%, seven, 7% which is 2% makes a lot of difference yeah. on this number. And I think to our, our credit, we use a more conservative number. So. Yeah. 
a lot of those numbers I say have come down in the last couple of years because everyone's kind of been called on the carpet on those higher numbers, but yeah. Yeah, okay. one thing to mention too is that you see that funding level overall decrease over the last four years. Uh, there are different things mm -hmm. that went into that. Uh, the biggest things, the mortality tables were updated, uh, rate of return has been updated, and so on. So it's not necessarily the, it's the benefits changed, but you know people live longer, therefore the liability grows. So okay. that's where the, I guess, the percentage changed, because a few years ago you were at 97%. Okay, continue. <laughs> So slide 32 is the same information for the police and fire pension plan and everything else that we just talked about holds true um, for police and fire. The, the plan has been and still is over that 60% mark. Uh, and the increase in the liability, like Martin said, is due to those changes in mortality tables. <coughs> slide 33. So this is the retired, this is your OPEB funding status. So this shows that this is the total liability per the actuarial evaluations each year. And as we talked about, there are no plan assets currently for OPEB. Question. How do you drop $30 million in one year, then go up $10 million the following year? You know, a couple of years down the road. We went from 162, 373, and 13, and 14. The liability dropped $30 million. Happened that year? Yeah. We could go back. How does that drop $30 million? I, I, I know this. Do you remember that? Fewer yes. people in the plan, maybe? Um, you know. <laughs> I, um, I believe what happened that year was we moved, um, uh, we moved the prescription drugs um, into a, um, a Part D plan. Um, and because of that, um, you are able to, the actuaries are able to take into consideration the reimbursements that the federal government makes on prescription drugs. Prior to 2014, the prescription drugs were being run through the same plan that the active and pre-65 retirees had. Um, and the city was actually collecting what's called the retiree drug subsidy. Oh, yeah. That subsidy is not a promise from the federal government, so the actuaries cannot take into consideration those funds to offset your liabilities. So simply by making that change from 2013 to 2014, no change in benefits, we just ran it through a different financing vehicle, so to speak. We, we lowered the OPEB <clears throat> considerably. Thank so you. Thank you very much. Then went up 20, 20 million the following year. Yeah, and that actually has to do with the the cost of retiree retiree That's medical. Twenty million in one year. So that hap that would that would be um, quit that would come with normal cost increases and any type of changes in mortality tables and things like that. that. So the same thing that Martin was saying is if people are going to be living longer, they're going to be getting health care longer. Okay. Um, Thank you. Go ahead. I believe the mortality tables increase about two or three years. It's, it's amazing what that can do to that number. Absolutely. Okay. Go ahead. This, this uh, particular chart that shows the, uh, the liabilities and we have no assets, can you explain to the people here in the uh, television audience how that's paid for? Without any assets? It's funded on a pay-as-you-go basis. How is that collected? The city is paying current premiums. So you're paying current premiums through current revenue sources. That How do we get that money? That, that, um, um, and I believe that liability is 8 or $9 million, correct? That, that is uh, funded through um, property taxes and when we looked at that other thing. So in our budget, we put in, and I think Jonathan helps us with the amount of the estimate in inflation. So if you added the, in the general fund, there's that health care and health care for retirees. Basically, if you add those two together, that'll get you the eight or nine million that we figure we're going to have to pay this year. So that's how we funded it. That's how most governmental entities have funded. But uh, with the change in, in the GASB and the change now in the state law, they're saying, no, you need to pre-fund health care costs. 
Okay, at this time we're going to ask the questions to be held till the end and so you can get through the whole thing. Okay, we'll Thank you. have a few more number of slides. So this, sure. if, if you don't mind, if we could do kind of like an expedited version, because um, one of the main, I mean, I talk about the elephant in the room. One of the main reasons we're here today is there were some questions by some council people about uh, some things that were of concern. And I just want to make sure, you know, from my personal viewpoint, that we definitely address those. And if there's anybody that's an expert to be able to address them, it be you guys uh, and gals. Um, so if you don't mind, we'll get those through, are important. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we then can, the, skip. Yep. The next three slides just show you, for the pen, two pension plans and your OPEB plan the actuarial required contribution compared to the actual contributions. So like we talked about for the two pension plans, you're required to fund that required contribution. So the city has been meeting those requirements. And then OPEB, if you turn to slide 36, this is what Councilman Bazzi was referring to where that, if you look at 2017, 13.9 million is what the actuary recommended right. if you contributed to fund the plan but in actuality, you're just you're you're paying current your premiums on a pay-as-you-go basis. So the last the last section is on Public Act 202. It it, it sounds like um, at least to some degree, this body has already been into that and had some discussions about that. Um, so I don't know how much time you want to spend on that right now, or if you want to table it. Yep. And ask questions. You know the information's here available for you. Um, I guess okay. I think what, one thing that maybe two things that aren't in there that are important. I did mention earlier though the funding requirements getting to that 40% is in fact over 30 years, and then um, the timeline for getting under that revenue trigger is five years. So that's not in here, but if you just, but I wanted to make sure you understood that because okay. we. Thank you very much. Um, do uh, anybody have any questions? Actually, uh, if we're. Uh, done with this. I'd like to go over some of the findings here and uh, just want to make sure that we, I mean, no, nobody likes to repeat findings. The auditors or even the auditees. Um, the first one on uh, 2017 one, it talks about 35, there was uh, 35 adjusting journal entries into the accounting records during the course of the audit. Um, what uh, can, can you kind of shed some light on that? What kind of adjustments were they? Or uh... just one second. Did you want to go? Or did you want me to? Go ahead. It's uh, two. Th it's I'm sorry. It's 2017. It's the first one. It's on page 11 of the findings. Zero zero one, yes. and it's under effect. Yes. So, so we did make, uh, like you said, a significant number of entries to make the statements correct. Uh, so they have been posted in order to make them accurate. If we had just, if, just to kind of clarify, I guess, the whole uh, issue here, is if we had just used the numbers in the financial statements as they were given to us, it would have been materially misstated, uh, the, the financial statements. So there were adjustments that were posted, some other cutoff issues uh, that we discussed. Uh, where we talk about the context and the accounting adjustments on page 10, uh, those are all the accounts that were affected uh, by us when we audited and we found the issues that Okay, it says, yes. Adjusted. So corrections to payroll, accounts payable, grant activity compensated, absences, capital assets, deferred inflows, shared state revenue, self-insurance, pension, installment purchase obligations. All of that, right. yeah. That, yeah. That, all but, of those, okay. But those are all the areas. With delinquent water, um, post-employment benefits obligation, and contingent liabilities. But that that's really a, a, a statement on John, who is no longer a controller. We didn't have that many. I, I miss Vince, but I'm convinced. Linda and I have talked about it, and Linda is very familiar with post-closing adjustments, and I think we'll do a good job. And But I miss you, Vince. We never got 34 when you were here. Uh, yeah. um, again, the reason why I'm mentioning these is nobody wants to repeat findings for next year, especially, I mean, 2018, since, I mean, you guys, you mentioned that you're in the process of doing an audit. Um, the other uh, thing that stinks, actually that stands out is uh, when you mentioned, you know, some of the, uh, was it uh, some adjustments, like especially, you know, payroll, absentee. 
Um, we have another finding here that we we have. Uh, I don't know what HR has done with that department. They have a, a manual system for reporting absences, uh, vacations, uh, that kind of stuff. I mean, is that is do we have a better system? I don't know if you guys got a chance That's to look at I that. I mentioned that Linda is. It's, I'm sorry. It is payroll related and accounting. And Linda, why don't you talk on that? So that relates to also absentees. So that goes to your department for absentees. Yeah, since we handle all the payroll, we handle all of the sick, vacation, compensated absences, and such. Um, I have been in uh, talks with Paylocity, and once if we sign up with them they will be able to keep that information within the payroll system. Currently, we're actually using paper cards that's tracking this information. And um, there's room for error there. So if we get the software that I'm requesting next year, it won't have to be done manually, and that will lessen the chance of any errors that we have on our part. But to clarify, for 2018, Linda, which is already done, that's probably going to show up again because it's still the manual system that you're now working to correct on a prospective basis. Yeah. Just so yeah, there's no surprises. I mean, no what we worked surprises. on it, we've gone through the spreadsheets that we right. did now, but it's still, it's a manual basis, and anything that's manual, you're, you're susceptible for more errors. That's why I want this payroll upgrade, and I want to get into a real fixed asset software because those spreadsheets are unmanageable and unreliable when it comes to calculating so, so more or less uh, we're on the honor system of people coming to work and no not necessarily oh, no i would okay. it's say not that, that. it's so, just i mean, I mean uh, how, do, how do you tell if somebody's on time not on time uh, there's time vacation clocks and vacation for some. slips being put in approved okay. by supervisors and things of that nature yeah yeah i mean there's it's done by slips um when we get this new software if we get it it'll be computer generated so if i put in for time off Oh, it's going to go to the mayor. The mayor the clicks, package. he accepts it. It'll be automatically marked on my time card when that time comes, even though I, I put my request in eight months in advance. Yes, no. No, okay, okay thank you. Um, Councilman. Okay, so last, last item. Um, you have one of the findings here. There was a demolition company that was used, and I was concerned about this one because it, was, it has something to do with federal funding, 2017-004. Um, talks about uh, the... The city did not perform the check for suspension and debarment before engaging the contractor used to perform demolition service. However, the city did subsequently confirm the contractor was not, was not suspended or debarred, but there was a finding. And there was also a corrective action letter that was sent by the controller. Um, I'm just kind of curious, uh, how did you guys find this one here? Did you guys look at the suspension? Uh, for uh, vendors or? So this was specific to um, our audit of the federal awards program and in particular in 2017 we were required to audit the FEMA grant program and so there's a lot of tests that are really um, sort of driven by what the federal government requires us to look at and what their compliance areas are for folks who receive federal dollars and one of them is the suspension and debarment and the really the spirit of it is to make sure that communities who are receiving federal dollars aren't engaging with contractors who are um, you know debarred from receiving federal dollars and so the the reason this is a this is um, a finding is not because you engaged with somebody who's disallowed from um, and, you know, participating in federal programs, but because the verification to ensure that person wasn't debarred didn't happen before the contract was entered into. So it wasn't a control, control deficiency, even though in the end it wasn't a compliance issue. So the federal government does require that check to happen before the contracts are executed, and that didn't occur in this instance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, has everybody done? Should we open it to the public for questions? Madam, no, I'd, I'd like to address something. Um, on the August uh, 14th meeting, City Council meeting, um, there were some serious concerns, and I just want to make sure we address them, and this is with no disrespect to Councilman Bazzi, but there were some serious concerns in the letter that was read that for day. myself. No, 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 not no, no. in yeah. that way. But for me, if those concerns are correct, this is the most perfect of time to be able to address them with people that are experts in that field. I mean, I'm just curious, do you happen to have that letter that you read? 
No, I already went the I mean, I, I put everything that I put in the letter was from the 2017. So if you look out to the 2017, and what they presented here is the same numbers. Okay. I tried so you can go back to the tape to uh, and no, look at it, and you can take address. notes. No, it was addressed. I already looked at it, and the same findings were put up on, on, uh, on the board. Thank you. Okay. At this time, we're going to ask the public to st step up to the microphone, state your name, limit it to three minutes, and if you have any questions, come on up to the microphone. Suzanne Todd, Academy Street. Um, a lot of this is Greek to me. If you put a medical chart in front of me, I can read it. I can tell you everything about that patient just by looking through the tests, test results. However, what I do look at is the financial statement audit findings. I can understand those. It's very concerning to me as a resident the city does not have su sufficient comprehensive processes and controls in place to complete its accounting and financial reporting functions, which should include a review function that would prevent or detect misstatements. During the audit, we identified a sign significant number of adjustments to the accounting records in order to correctly state the city's financial statements at year end. This is from Plant Moran. We also identified various adjustments to the accounting records that technically should have been made in order to correctly state the city's financial statements at year end, but were not, as management did not deem these items to be significant enough to correct in the accounting records. These items are referred to as past adjustments since the, since the city passed I'm recording them. So, in your audit this year, I don't expect you to address everything, but are you going to address these audit findings from last year? Will they be addressed? Because it's very concerning to me. Okay. If there's findings, if there's adjustments, then it's going to be recorded again. Okay. But you will look for what was stated. We'll look know. at the controls around those areas. We'll what do you mean by the controls? What I mean is we're not going to re-audit 2017 right. numbers, but we'll go back to um, sort of the processes and procedures around grant accounting, around compensated absence accounting. We'll go back to sort of the processes and procedures, but we won't go back to the prior year. Yeah, we'll test 2018 numbers. Right. To make sure that these are okay, that yeah, these have what been... What we're saying is if there's continued issues in those areas or other areas, if we will report it again. Okay. okay, and my other concern is the water fund. Um, constantly, thousands and thousands of dollars are taken out of the water fund for things that have nothing to do with the water fund. It's like the boom truck, as Councilman Musket said. We don't have sewers in the sky. We don't have uh, water mains in the sky. So why is a boom truck, and I've seen it a, couple, a few times on the uh, claims. So why, are, why is this money being taken out of the water fund when it should be taken out of something else? Okay, thank you very much. Time is up. Good evening, Zuhair Abdelham. I have several questions. Uh, when uh, the money was collected for the health care system, it was collected under Act 345, which is specifically for police and fire department pension. Now, is that allowed under general accepted standards of accounting to collect money for something and there's something else? So that's a legal question. Okay. I'm not sure I understand the question. 
Okay. And I defer to administration officers. Yeah, we have we have a legal a legal opinion which uh, every so often you as auditors have come and asked uh, to look at it or get a copy of it. And we just had that updated because this issue uh, came up, was raised by a councilwoman that's not here tonight. And the uh, city attorney reaffirmed their opinion. I think it's from 2003, but it, it was obtained by uh, Mayor Canfield, Ruth Canfield, and indicated that they came to the same conclusion that Act 345 while being restricted only for police and fire, which is what we do, could be utilized for both uh, pension and health care. But only the, the health care for police and fire? Only for police and fire only. I agree. That's the way we do it. Can we tag other expenses <laughs> to the health care uh, you know, uh, fund? Can we tag other expenses related to something else has nothing to do with the health care? Is that accepted in the general accounting stand? Accepted? I'm sorry, I'm not clear with the question. Do you want to we collected money for the health care system. My understanding, there was money tagged for something else. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the health care. Is that accepted or this should be addressed? That when we collect money for X or Y or Z, it should be in the financial statement, it should be declared under a number, specific number, it is for a specific job, for a specific issue, or we can intermingle all these things together. Are you referring to Act 345? So if you're referring to Act 345, that's the legal opinion that you're okay. looking for health care and retirement. All right. Okay. Uh, do you audit the contracts which are funded by federal funds, meaning sometimes, and I be very specific, uh, I looked at the average cost per square foot nationwide for building, it's $125 per square foot. We have a bathroom where the, the square foot cost $300 per square foot. Now, do you audit these things to correct them to see if next time, you know, uh, we go for better uh, process to bid it or for quotations. So what we'll do is we'll test based on the grant agreement. Yes. And if, you know, the grant agreement, if you need to bid for it, we'll, we'll review the bidding procedures, we'll review which bid was selected, how. Uh, we, I, I can't say we test if it's $300 per square foot or 125, but we review the procedures and requirements from the grant. If, if, if I might, at CDBG, um, Mr. Abdelhaq gave me a paper in which he got some quote from a contractor that he could have done the job slightly under 100000 I did talk to the director at CDBG, and he indicated that the project had to be bid. That was a little bitter. The other thing is that uh, all the employees are subject to Davis-Bacon, so uh, the wages are going to be significantly different, and the, and the contractor had to qualify as a federal contractor. And so uh, that and some other things that came up on the particular project, but uh, that was the director's comment as to why there was such a difference between his bid that he obtained and the actual cost. The other thing I was going to mention is all the granting agencies approve the budget, so they basically authorize what you can spend the dollars on, that's what guides what we do. We go back to say, well, what did HUD, what did HUD approve and say you can spend this money on? And is that how you spent it? We don't have discretion necessarily like that. What is the Davis-Bacon range between the regular person or the difference? It's requirements that, you know. The requirement. Is it 10 to 15 percent difference? I, I don't want to the wrong number, but there's, the, the wages are publicly out there, so we yeah. pull them down. The most it is between months. 10 to 15 percent maximum, the difference between yeah. somebody under that act or somebody. Yeah, I don't, we don't know the exact but, but anyway, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? <coughs> okay, that includes our study session. Have a good night.